Riverside Explorers here at Phoenixville, PA at the American Treasure Tour. This is one man's collection of random eclectic vintage items related to pop culture and also like uh, antique music machines like band organs, things like that. Also there's like dollhouse, there's a dollhouse collection, there's just like so many random weird things. I've heard really good things about this and I've been meaning to check it out. It's only been open for two years and I'm excited to check it out so come along with us. So we're here in the music room. This is the part where you can walk around. They have this huge collection of band organs and mechanical musical instruments and all kinds of stuff like that. Nickelodeons. Look at all those things. He paid. Yeah. So much money for oh yeah, there's there's a lot of them. Look at this one. It has a accordion at the top. It's from 1930. It's like an Art Deco style. And this one too. That one's really cool. I guess this was. Yeah, this is like one of those teaching organs for schools and I guess places that teach music. And they have a whole bunch of miniature dioramas all around. There's something playing over here. I'm assuming these things are on a timer or something. the different notes on each instrument. I want to know how the, paper, how the paper rolls work. They have perforations on them? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, here's one. Yeah. These little things yes. here, these little slots activate yes. the different notes in the, on the yep. instruments. Yeah. And this has got an accordion. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, hey, I want to hear one of these, right? Yeah. Whoa, look at that. I know that's cool. to say the least. This is the area where you get on the tram for the tour. Oh, 
Fiberglass James Dean. Yeah. We have the great honor of being the weirdest museum in the greater Philadelphia region. Did you know we were not upset or offended when they called us weird? We definitely embraced that title. I'm pretty sure we're the only place in the world where you can find Dora the Explorer and her co-pilot Alf. They're going to be on your right in a soapbox derby car. And we hear Alf is going to make a return to television. I'm wondering if there's going to be any gray in his fur when he returns. He's been gone a while. But of course, Alf is an alien, so he might age a little bit differently than we do. And now, one of the very few things I do know about our mystery owner is he started collecting with automobiles. And we will see plenty of them on our tour today. The first car is going to come up on your right. It is a 1956 two-door hardtop convertible Thunderbird. They made that car for three years, 1955, 56, and 57. And as a result, the Thunderbird did compete with the Corvette. But they sold too many more Thunderbirds at this time than they did Corvettes. I will point out at least one Corvette as we go along, but you may notice that Thunderbird only has two seats, and that might not be practical. If you need more of a family car, look no further than just past it on the right. You'll find a 1958 Studebaker station wagon. That model is called the Scotsman, and if you bought that Studebaker new in 1958, it would cost you a whopping $1,776. If you take a look to your left, we're going to pass three circus wagons. And each of our wagons are full of animations called automatons. There was sort of a perfect storm that happened in the 1890s because electricity was coming to the big cities for the first time. And at the same time, plate glass was invented. Stores saw that as their golden opportunity and decided to blow out their fronts, creating storefronts. And the art of window oh, dressing came into match. existence. Oh, the first time it didn't matter what you put in your windows as long as it moved. People in general at this time could not afford to have electricity in their homes. So they were willing to travel from miles away into the cities to come in and see the electricity in the windows. And we do have hundreds of these animations and displays that I'll point out as we get further into our tour. But past those wagons on your left, you'll find our interpretation of dogs playing poker. Dogs playing poker and pull this made famous in the 1960s. It started as 16 original paintings that were in calendars. People just loved them so much, they had written map calendars to hang them on their walls. We do have one of the most famous of those paintings, enlarged framed inlet just past it. The title of that painting is A Friend in Need because of the bulldog passing his buddy an ace under the table. If you continue to look left, you'll find amusement park rides. The two bumper cars in the back are from the 1950s. They are Dodge and Bumper Cars. The two in front that are blue, green, in color are Lessie Brother Auto Scooters from the 1940s. And just past them is a wooden roller coaster carriage from the 1930s. That was made by Philadelphia Toboggan Company, and it was located in Willow Grove Park, just east of us here. As you may notice, there are no seatbelts or lap bars in that roller coaster carriage. There were no safety regulations on roller coasters in the 1930s, so you'd hop in that thing and hold on and pray as you would go over the hills of the coaster. Mm -hmm. And as we make our first turn, you take a look oh, to your nice left under the Nike her. sign, you'll find some old tractor seats. And then, of course, we had to have some tractors to go along with them. If you take a look to your right, you'll find a Mustang and a Camaro convertible from the late 60s. Coming up halfway down this hallway on your left, you'll find the first of the Corvettes we have in this collection. Here is one more that I'll point out along the way. This is just the first, but past this Corvette, you'll find the beginning of our motorcycle collection. You'll find we have quite a few motorcycles here. They go the entire length of this hallway on the left-hand side. And I'm going to hop off of the tram in just a moment. That way I can point out a few items on the left so you guys don't miss them. Now usually, I would start talking about the large red rep motorcycle we have right down this way, but not too long ago the owner came in and dropped off the miniature Indian motorcycle that's just next to it here. He came in after hours, plopped it down there, and just left it for me to find on the first tour the next morning. It's actually a pretty common occurrence around here, so now the smallest motorcycle is next to the largest, the rep. The rep has two wheels in the back and one in the front, and Elvis Presley had one just like it in the early 70s. 
and that is the only reason we have it. Our owner is a huge Elvis fan, obviously. He likes motorcycles as well, so when he heard Elvis was going around on a rep, he just went out and purchased his very own because of it. But what might be the most interesting thing to your left is not a motorcycle. It's from 1916, and this is our Custer chair, the first self-propelled wheelchair invented in America. It was made by a man named Loser Custer. He was from Dayton, Ohio. And a fun fact about Dayton, in 1916, the speed limit was 12 miles per hour. And your Custer chair here could go 15. So you could speed in your Custer chair. You could literally keep up with the cars on the road. And if somebody dared to get in your way when you were in your Custer chair, they actually thought this through. Because all you had to do was ring that bell. And people would hear you coming and hopefully move out of your way. Like I said, the motorcycles do go all the way down on the left. But I'm going to start talking about it's going to come up on the right because we have some rag top convertibles up ahead on the right here. The first of the rag tops is a 67 Oldsmobile. In the middle, you'll find the second yeah. part Actually, that I promised. Dark, right? And it was worth the wait because this is a 1954 pennant blue Corvette. Corvettes were first made in 1953, but they really didn't start selling them to the public until the next year, 54, which is when this car here is from. They only made about 300 in Pennant Blue in 54, and Dars is all original Wrong. under the hood. And then on the end is a 1960 black Cadillac. There are fins in the back of this car, red leather interior. It's definitely a very stylish car. And speaking of style, if you look ahead of you at the end of this hallway, you'll find a huge shoe. This came to us from Wedding Central, a cable TV channel. And I'm sure you'll notice along the way, we love things big and small here. Past a fairly large Ronald McDonald is going to be a really interesting item on your right. A bicycle built for seven people. That is called a Kobe, C-O-B-I. It is short for Conference Bicycle. So you and six of your closest friends and family members can all hop on that thing and everyone would do their part in pedaling. And you'd put the most responsible of your group at the helm steering. Kobe bikes designed in San Francisco. They've made over 300 Kobe's to date. The building we are in used to be a BF Goodrich tire factory. And then in its heyday in the 1970s, they produced about 12,000 tires a day here. And then Michelin bought them in the 80s, and they shipped their productions overseas. And that left all 1.2 billion square feet of this building empty. The new owner of this building, instead of tearing it down, decided to repurpose the space. And it does house many businesses today. Of the original 1.2 million the American Treasure Tour does take up 100,000 square feet of space. And along the wall to the left through this hallway, we are going to pass many of our beloved cartoon characters. Everybody has their favorites. I know I enjoy a bunch so of characters on the oh, wall yeah, to the left here. Oh, look at that. And coming up at the end of this hallway to your right, in all of their glitz and glam, you'll find our Mummers costumes. The first Mummers parade was New Year's Day, 1901, in Philadelphia. That tails Wasn't that a mess? Oh, wow. There's more up there.
just the first of many band organs. We are going to hear on our tour today. We are about to enter a room full of them. We call this the band organ room. And this space can be especially overwhelming. There is a lot to see and a lot to talk about. So we're gonna make two trips around this next room. On the first trip, we're just gonna focus on the right side. And when we loop back around, I will tell you what's happening on the left side of this room. <laughs> New York, it's up high Niagara Falls. You may be surprised to hear that Blue Machine's identical twin sister is directly to the left of it, the machine that appears to be green. We've repainted the blue one so you can see what the machine would look like new, and the green one shows you about 100 years of weather and wear. Band organs are outdoor machines. They look good carousels and on fairgrounds, that sort of thing. So as you can see, they definitely took a beating over time battling the elements, the wind and the rain. And band organs usually feature screens on the front of them. And the reason for the screens is since these machines are pneumatic, meaning they take in air, it would have the tendency to take in bugs. And to the right is this giant coil. The coil starts right here by me, and it goes the entire length of this room. Do you guys recognize the coil as anything? It is a slinky. It's actually the world's largest oh. slinky. Oh. It's 100 feet long and 48 inches in diameter. That makes it the world's largest. you'll find in this collection. He originally was wow. in one of the very first storefronts in America in the 1890s, and he still swallows that sword every single day. And as we continue along, we're gonna take a listen to the Wurlitzer Band Organ that's located in the front right-hand corner of this room. It's gold in nice. color. This is the last machine the Wurlitzer Company ever made. That's the oldest one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, look, there's that one that you showed me before. Oh After winter and Christmas does come springtime and Easter, which we have represented by all of the bunnies here. And in with our rabbits, you'll find two of the newer additions to this collection, the giant marshmallow peeps, orange and green. Peeps are made not too far away from us here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And they just did a study, America eats 700 million peeps each year. And don't miss, at the end of this road to your right, you'll find a puppet show wow. starring Pinocchio. That animatronic rabbit. Mm -hmm. warning as we come around the next corner because on your left will be a 12 foot tall clown face. Now this clown is smiling. I have tried to convince me that he is friendly but I get to turn him on in the morning and I turn this guy off when I leave at night so I choose to avoid eye contact with this wow. big guy here. But if you're feeling brave you can look this clown right in his red eyes. I just choose not to. And past the clown is an oversized walk man. Walkman is here to represent another form of obsolete music delivery system, just like band organs in this room and the Nickelodeons you can hear in our music room. We really don't use Walkman too often anymore. Gremlin. He's been replaced by newer music technology. And coming up halfway it's down this hallway on your left is my personal favorite item on the tram tour, and it is huge. Sure, everyone can already see at least part of the Popsicle Stick Castle. And this is so large that it made its way into the 2009 Guinness Book of World Records for being the largest Popsicle Stick structure. Man, his name is Steve Gooman from Connecticut. And he built this castle with 396,000 Popsicle Sticks. And it is held together by four gallons of Elmer's Blue. As we take a peek inside and we continue along, we're going to take a quick listen to the Mortier Dance Hall organ in front of us, the big blue machine. His name is the Emperor. Coliseum. And Steve plans to make it one million popsicle sticks. 
more than double the size of his castle, so that is what takes up a lot of city time these days. Like, um, and past his castle on the left, you'll find one of the most recognizable families in America, the Simpsons. In April of yeah, last year, The Simpsons around, became the longest-running scripted primetime show in television history. They beat out Gunsmoke for that title. The Simpsons have been on TV now for 30 years. Three decades of Simpsons. And coming up at the end of this hallway to your left, you'll find a staff favorite animation. It's Baby Goats, or Kids and they are having a pillow fight. And you'll see that Mama Goat does come in to check on them every once in a while. Oh, oh and it looks like our goats managed to get away with it that time. But I think our kids are feeling a little too confident, right? Because they managed to get away with it. As soon as their mother leaves the room, they hop right back up again to go back at that pillow fight. And you know it is never fair because that brother always gets the pillow. Poor sister never even gets a chance. They just give that poor girl a bell. Up, oh, uh oh. Busted by Mama Goat. She gives her kids a real earful when she sees what they've been up to. We love that animation because it's unpredictable. Sometimes our goats manage to get away with it. It's obviously, sometimes they do not. Mm -hmm. And as you come around the corner, if you look to your right, you'll find some Halloween displays. And along the wall, Halloween are all replicas of sideshow banners. These are exact replicas, except for their size. They originally would have been much, much larger. We commissioned a Lancaster County artist named Joan Faye to paint these for us. And when we did that, we asked her to shrink them down. We wanted to fit many acts on each wall. They originally would have been so large they could have fit on a whole wall on their own. Because in the early 1900s, when the circus came to town, if their sideshow didn't make it along with them, they would hang their banners just like these, but on a huge scale. Because the banners were the only way the people in town, but no jacks came along. You can see anything at the sideshow, from the alligator boy to Vicky, the four-legged girl. And these acts were also called dime shows, because it only cost you 10 cents, or a dime, to get to see any act you can find on the wall to the right here. <laughs> So these planes should have been able to fly at one time. And coming up on the wall to your left, just past this backdrop from the Fulton Opera House, you'll find Halloween masks. And each of these masks were from Collegeville Costume Company, which was just one exit west of us here. And this company was in business for 50 years before they closed in 1994. And that's when our owner decided to buy out their stock. And past the masks, You'll find four of the three stooges on the wall. Ten actors throughout the years have portrayed a stooge, and we definitely love those stooges here. So much so, I don't know if you had time to notice, but we did decide to name our trams after them. We have three trams here. There's three stooges. It made a lot of sense at the time. 
we are on my personal favorite tramp today, Curly. And coming up at the end of this hallway to your left in frames, you'll find some watercolor artworks. Each of the watercolors on the wall to your left will represent a Broadway show. And we actually have about a hundred of these watercolor paintings and they are all in frames and ready to be put up on the wall. But unfortunately, we have run out of the wall space to hang all of them. As I'm sure you can imagine, wall space becomes a bit of an issue okay. here at the American Treasure Tour. And as we make our way into this next area, if you take a look to your left, just beyond the huge shoe from Wedding Central, you'll find four trucks in this next space that are about 100 years old. The first truck is a GMC. The dark green is a Pierce Arrow. The brighter green is a Mack truck, and on the end you'll find a Nash Quad. But between the Mack and the Nash Quad, I'm sure you'll notice that we have three people here that do not belong together. They are Teddy Kennedy, Donald Trump, and you'll find that Britney Spears the Baptist trio. And the only thing those three people have in common, they were each on their own individual Mardi Gras floats in New Orleans about a decade or so ago. And past the trucks, I promise you will not miss Gumpy, who's standing here. He's pretty big. This has been verified as being the largest Gumpy in the world. He stands almost 20 feet tall. And on the far wall of this room, you'll find three more of our band organs. The largest in the middle is a Wurlitzer Model 175. And this is the only 175 the Wurlitzer Company ever made. It lived with a carousel in Denver, Colorado before being put into storage for many years. And when we first got our hands on this machine, it was in terrible shape. It took us almost a whole year to repair it, but it should play now. those trusted pet boys, Manny, Mel, and Jack. They started their company in Philadelphia in 1921. The toy box area does house most of our cars. We're gonna pass a bunch more on the right. The first on the corner is a Dodge 440 Coronet from 1968. This is a muscle car. It's a... Down the next row on your right, you'll find our pickup trucks. The second one in the green one is a 1950 Dodge Power Wagon. And on the end here, you'll find a Ford pickup. And we are about to make our last turn. And as we do, you'll pass on your left this miniature fire truck. And believe it or not, this was a working fire truck. It lived in this building when it was the BF Goodrich Tire Factory. And it would go around putting out small mechanical fires, bringing first aid to the workers here. 
And the big red car on the right corner is a 1948 Hudson Commodore. Hudson was unique in that it was the first American automobile company to employ a female designer. Her name was Betty Thatcher, and she designed dashboards. The big black car around the corner on your left is a 1934 Buick. And this car is highly stylized. It features the suicide doors and definitely reminds us of the gangster era we had here in America. And there is a bullet hole in the back of that Buick. I do not know the story of how it arrived there, but I do assume there must be some sort of explanation. Bullet holes don't usually show up on their own. And halfway down this hallway on your right, you'll find a 1909 Sears and Roebuck motor buggy. That's a car you could not find on a car lot. You could only order it at a few Sears catalog for $395. They'd send it to you on a train, you'd pick it up at the station, just drive yourself home in it that same day. It features a tiller bar instead of a steering wheel. And Sears actually advertised that it was so easy to drive that a child could drive it. And technically, a child could drive that motor buggy because there were no laws against children driving in 1909. But thankfully, the automobile industry did come a long way very quickly in America. And we can see some of that proof in the green car that's just past the motor buggy. Because just 40 years later, in 1949, Ford released this model. And it was given the affectionate nickname of the shoebox. Sign of that Ford was a little boxier than Americans were used to at that time. That's how it gained that lovely nickname. And then on the end here, right, you'll find our two Crosleys. These two cars are from the early 50s, and you may notice they are two of the smallest cars that you've seen on our tour today. And it might be because of their size that poor Crosley really didn't sell very many of them. But before I feel too badly for Mr. Crosley, he did manage to sell thousands and thousands of Crosley radios. And it's inventions like the radio that put Van Dorgan to be heard on our tour today. And the Nickelodeon's Cross the Hall Music Room out of business. I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. I'm willing to bet that that's from some sort of roadside attraction. Lots of fun. Looks like these are from a wax museum or something. You said they are from Chuck E. Cheese? Here's some animatronics from Chuck E. Cheese. This place is amazing. If you're in the area, you have to check this out because it's probably the biggest and most eclectic collection I've ever seen. It's so big that you can't even really see everything in the first ride to the Like you have to, you literally have to come back and go through this tour like two or three times to see everything. Look at his Chuck E. Cheese costume. Or I guess that's one of the animatronics actually. Welcome to Grover's Mill. This was in a movie. From War of the Worlds. There's a video disc player, one of the original laser disc players. Look at all these VHS tapes stacked up.
And these little cars, I think these are from an amusement ride. I actually have a big collection of CED video discs. Not a lot of people know about that one. Tons of antique musical stuff, band organs. I mean, if you're into that sort of thing, this is the museum here too. An artist pipe dream for men only. Peep show. You will look, put your dime in and look in there. You'd get to see some nude women. Coney Island. Bunch of movie posters. Yes, that was the American Treasure Tour in Phoenixville. Probably the coolest collection I've ever seen. <laughs> What's really cool is we collect like just random eclectic vintage stuff like that too. So it's a lot like yeah. our collection, but like on a much bigger scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't even call that a collection. It's like a hoard. <laughs> Here at Oaks, Pennsylvania, in front of Arnold Family Fun Center, and they have this huge muffler man. I think this one's called Happy Half Wit. He's like modeled after Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. Big fiberglass muffler man. And then they have this big fiberglass giraffe here. 